it's a great pleasure to have this chance to to talk to such a large audience. I think it's one of the largest I've ever uh, spoken with in my career. And uh, so so let me let me get started. Uh, so back in 1980, when I was a young graduate student, the uh, first machine learning workshop was held at Carnegie Mellon University. It was organized by Jaime Carbonell, Tom Mitchell, and Richard Michalski. And uh, there were about 30 people in attendance there. And I think if you went to that meeting, you would not even know, recognize it really as a machine learning uh, meeting, because many of the issues that were discussed were very different. Um, and uh, so I'll give a little bit of sense of, of what those were, but, uh, but mostly it was about exact learning. We had the, the goal that our learning algorithms would find the right answer. Uh, and there was not a, a notion of statistical uh, or approximate answers at all. Uh, and so the, the plan for my talk today is to uh, go through these six challenges for machine learning. And uh, uh, some of these will be uh, familiar to many of you, I'm sure, uh, but some of them I think are, are at the forefront of what we're trying to, uh, what the problems we're confronting now uh, with real world applications. So the first challenge is generalization. So back in uh, 1980, Probably the best uh, paper that was at the at that very first workshop was by Ross Quinlan, who's now retired in Sydney, Australia. But he, at the time, was working uh, developed a decision tree algorithm called ID3, the iterative, iterative dichotomizer three, uh, and was applying it to take chess endgame data and compress it into simple decision rules. So in those days, Ken Thompson, who was already famous as the inventor of, Lin of Unix, um, had uh, been reverse enumerating the winning positions for chess endgames. So here we have the chess endgame uh, king and rook versus king, so a very simple endgame. You can enumerate all the possible board positions and decide which ones are, are winning positions and which ones are losing positions. So this becomes a binary classification problem. Given a chess board and a position, uh, is the game won or not? Um, and uh, and so what he did was uh, take these very large tables. From the tables, of course, a computer could play perfectly these end games, but the tables were very were too complicated for people to use. And so the idea was to uh, boil them down using uh, ID3 into a set of rules that a person could memorize so that you could play the, game, the end games yourself perfectly. So down here on the lower right, you probably can't read it all, but you can see that there are a bunch of features and tests and this is the way he would describe a, a decision tree. So the things to notice here are, first of all, there was no generalization. The entire space of all possibilities had been enumerated, and it was just a question of compression. And the second thing was that being able to interpret the resulting rules was absolutely important. Um, so nowadays, of course, we worry about generalization, and we have a lot of noise and incompleteness in our data. But interpretability is still uh, one of the most important uh, uh, challenges that we face. So today, generalization is the key. So um, we, uh, of course, are interested in generalizing from, uh, from what we call independent and identically distributed data. So if we can assume that the data that we are seeing is not changing over time, so it is stationary, then we can give very strong theoretical guarantees for machine learning. So we know that if the training set is large enough, and we use the right algorithms, we will do well in, and accurately uh, predicting future um, uh, 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 points. But um, we're now seeing in many applications that this assumption of stationarity is rarely true in practice. The test data is always changing, and it can be changing actually because we're deploying the machine learning system. After all, uh, uh, usually the reason we're building a machine learning system is we want to make a change in the world. We want to uh, be more effective at, at detecting frauds, or we want to meet customers' needs better. This, of course, will change customer behavior. And so it it's, uh, uh, automatically means that, that, that the distribution that we're going to see will be changing. So I want to give you a sense of two uh, leading edge techniques for trying to generalize beyond just the uh, uh, stationary IID case. The first of these is causal transportability. So many of you may be aware that of uh, Yudea Pearl's work in causality. I, I rec uh, recommend his book, uh, The Book of Why, that uh, explains his causality theory uh, very clearly. Um, 
but it's based on building these causal diagrams. So here on the right, you can see that we have this little causal diagram and uh, uh, the, um, the, the, the letters indicate um, uh, the uh, T stands for a patient has lung cancer and A stands for a patient is taking aspirin and C is whether they're experiencing chest pain. Now it's possible that uh, that that uh, if you if they have cancer but they are also taking aspirin then they would not have the chest pain, right? So, but the absence of chest pain does not mean that they do not have cancer, right? So we would say here that the aspirin can kind of block or mask the chest pain. Um, one thing we don't know about these patients is whether they're smokers or not. That's that's K. If they're a smoker, that might uh, influence both the fact that they are uh, that they're getting lung cancer and also that they might be taking aspirin. And this variable S here is uh, called a selection variable. And the idea is that um, that that we we um, the setup I should say, uh, which I say down here on the bottom, is that suppose we have training data from one hospital and we're going to fit our machine learning model to that data. But we would like to apply the same model at other hospitals. Now, it could be that in some hospitals, the physicians uh, like to prescribe aspirin, and in others, they maybe do not like to prescribe aspirin. So the value of this A variable, or its probability distribution, may shift over time uh, as we go from one hospital to another. And so that's what this S variable indicates. It says that this, this variable, um, is a variable whose uh, probability distribution might change when we go from one hospital to another. And what, uh, uh, in a very important paper by Pearl and Berenboim back in 2011, that won the uh, AAAI Best Paper Prize that year, uh, they showed that, um, uh, that they can create what's called causal transportability, that if the causal model is correct, then they can learn a classifier that is guaranteed to work correctly in the new hospital as well as the old. And there's been some refinements of that technique. Uh, this is coming out of Suchi Saria's group at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Um, they're able to handle a slightly larger uh, family of, of models. So they generate, uh, 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 they use this causal diagram to generate all possible models that can make the cancer variable independent of the selection variable. And then they can evaluate each of those models on validation data and keep the best of them. And this is guaranteed to transport, again, guaranteed to transport across hospitals, provided that the causal diagram is correct. So, um, of course, uh, we don't know that the causal diagram is correct, but this is where we can rely on the expertise of physicians. Um, and I, I like this methodology because it encourages uh, the designer of the system to think in advance about what might change between training time and uh, test time or deployment time. And I think we need to, to adopt methodologies that, that do more of that. The uh, second technique that's, uh, that's, that's been developed and is a little controversial, I should uh, caution, is something called domain adversarial training. And the idea here is uh, that um, uh, we, uh, we have training data from, say, uh, two or more domains. So we might, uh, if we think about hospitals, we might have training data from two different hospitals, D1 and D2. But the data from the first hospital is labeled training data, so we know the outcome of the, of the patients, whether they have cancer or not. But the data from hospital number two is unlabeled data. And, uh, and so the idea is to set up a, 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 this is a neural network technique, in which we try to solve two tasks simultaneously. Um, the first task is we want to correctly predict on the D1 data, given XI, we want to correctly predict YI, the right answer. But on, uh, but, but how do we use the second data, uh, training data, D2? We set up, we, we label all the D1 points as belonging to, uh, to hospital one, and all the D2 points as belonging to hospital two. And we try to tell the difference. Did, given a, a data point XI, did it come from hospital one or hospital two? Now, if we can tell those data apart, that is a sign, a very strong signal that the distribution of data points from hospital one is different from the distribution at hospital two. Um, but now the idea is, can we learn a hidden representation in which it is impossible to tell the difference between the hospitals? So we want to do as well as possible on predicting the correct label for D1 
and do no better than random guessing on telling the difference between D1 and D2. Um, and so the neural network structure looks something like this, right? We have our input here and it goes through some number of layers to produce a hidden representation, which are the features. And then that hidden representation is used to do two things at once. On the top, it's used to predict um, the, the, the outcome Y, the, the, the disease of the patient, perhaps. And on the bottom, it's, it's used, uh, the same representation is used to try to predict whether a data point X belongs to class to hospital one or hospital two. Now the data for hospital two can't uh, train this thing here, but all the data can train the, the bottom part. And so together, they try to find this representation that maintains as much information needed for making the classification decision while throwing away any information that, that would, that would uh, reveal the difference between the two hospitals. Now it turns out that this makes an assumption that's not at all obvious when you look at it. The assumption is that uh, the, the, the class probabilities uh, will be the same in the two domains. Uh, if that's not true, so if one hospital has many more cancer patients than another, then this will fail. But here are some examples on some sort of uh, quasi-synthetic problems. Um, so, so they looked at four, uh, four pairs of domains. So this was the source domain is D1 and the target domain is D2. And this was MNIST and then this is MNIST M, which is, uh, you know, uh, with, with fancy backgrounds. And this is synthetic house numbers and real house numbers, uh, house numbers and MNIST digits and synthetic signs and real street signs. And uh, what this plot shows is the accuracy on the um, target domain. So on the, uh, of, of uh, this, this, if we just took the classifier from domain D1 and just applied it, trained on it and just applied it to D2, we wouldn't do very well. I mean, in a couple of these domains, we're, you know, we're down about 50% correct. I mean, this is over 10 classes, so 50% is not so terrible, but it's not great either. If we apply their technique, which is this domain adversarial training, uh, you can see that the orange bars give us uh, substantial improvements, um, especially in these. Not so much in this one, but performance was already very good here. And the gray bar is sort of the best we could hope for if we actually could train, if we had training data for the target domain. So the difference between the orange and the gray bars is kind of the headroom that one might hope we could uh, close that gap. Um, so you see that it works pretty well in this case, and there's a lot of experimental success with this. Um, but but uh, but there but but uh, we know there are theoretical reasons why um, this technique can't, uh, is not uh, guaranteed to produce uh, good results. As I say, it assumes that the class label distribution is not changing, and the, the method can be unstable. And so it works best if you do have at least some label data in the target domain so that you can choose the hyperparameters and so on. So it's, uh, it's best if you, if you do have uh, at least some, some representative sample. Okay, well, that's the first challenge. Let's go on to the second one, um, which is feature engineering. Now, of course, feature engineering is, is, uh, is really the secret to success in, in all machine learning problems. It's really where the machine learning engineer and the data scientists bring their knowledge of the domain to bear to, to uh, make better features that can be more accurate and also that can be more understood. So if you looked at Ross Quinlan's features for chess, they were not uh, just that the just the raw things that there's a piece at you know at uh, a three, but, uh, but 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 was much more about the distances between uh, rooks and kings and and things like this. Um, so uh, the the uh, the only thing I want to say here is that uh, uh, I think feature engineering uh, uh, also raises the challenge of um, of creating metadata definitions for the features. So uh, very often we tend to write our features, at least in, in the, the old way of doing things, uh, was to write our features in C or, or uh, uh, whatever language we were working with, uh, Python these days, um, and it was just a, a block of code. But, uh, but, but um, Mark Fox, who's at uh, Toronto, I love his uh, saying that numbers should never travel alone across the internet. Instead, we should have a, a language that uh, provides the definition of the feature. And he has an example for um, 
what does the student teacher ratio in a school system mean? And, uh, and he gives this example here um, where, where uh, we have uh, you know, the, the ratio between the number of students that are registered in the schools and the, uh, um, uh, the divided by the sum of the full-time equivalents uh, effort level of all the teachers in those schools. Um, so in Big ML, of course, we have the flatline language, which uh, lets you write these kinds of features very easily. Other folks are using SQL, um, and there are other companies like Trifacta that provide uh, rule languages for this purpose. But I think this is very important um, because then uh, the, 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 when you have that metadata available, then you can allow data consumers to detect when the meaning of a feature has changed, even when the feature name has not changed. Um, and, uh, and this is critical for, for detecting data errors and debugging classifier failures. So, of course, one uh, claim that's made for deep learning is that it automates uh, a feature engineering. And so I wanted to, to uh, address that question, does it really do that? And the answer is yes and no. Um, so uh, if we look at uh, 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 computer vision, um, I, I, th I think uh, deep learning applications still require a very careful data preparation. So images need to be normalized, contrast enhanced, uh, resized, and so on. Um, and so in that sense, deep learning is not doing that automatically. That's something that, uh, that data scientists need to do. But, but there is a sense in which, yes, deep learning can learn some powerful intermediate representations. And I think this is the biggest lesson uh, that came out of the deep learning revolution for me, was that you know, before 2012, this is, this is the performance of a top five classification error on the ImageNet 1000 class problem. And before 2012, the error rates were up in the 25 to 30% range, and we were using manually designed SIFT and HOG features uh, to extract information out of the images. And, uh, and, and then this was combined with support vector machine or random forest classifiers um, to, uh, to, to uh, make the decision. But after 2012, by using convolutional neural networks, um, the uh, network itself learned its own uh, features to extract from images and performance went way up. So, uh, uh, so, so in that sense, deep learning can help provided you have a lot of data so that you can do this. Okay, the, the third challenge is explanation and interpretability. And so of course, in 1980, Ross Quinlan wanted interpretability because he expected people to memorize the learned decision tree. Um, nowadays, we don't expect that, but in practice, we need to check whether the learning algorithm has got the, the right answer or not. Um, and we need to, to debug the system and, and ask, well, how can we improve things? Uh, and, and unfortunately, today, our highest performing models, like random forests, boosted trees, or deep neural networks, they are not interpretable. Um, and of course, this is a very hot topic in machine learning research right now, is can we develop ways of giving at least local interpretability to these models for individual predictions? And how can we get more global interpretability so that we can identify parts of the model that, that, uh, that, that are not working well and get some idea of what could we do to improve them. I think this is the, the number one reason for interpretability is, is uh, I want, there's, there's an area where, uh, a sub-region of the space where I'm not doing well, how can I improve that, that area? Okay, uh, one thing I think uh, uh, I wa want to emphasize is that an explanation or an interpretable model is really not uh, it's not a freestanding question. Instead, uh, when we're producing an explanation, it should be to help the user perform some task, right? So it's a task-specific explanation or, it's, uh, or interpretable for a particular purpose. So for example, uh, in this table here, uh, suppose we're building a predictive model um, and the user is a machine learning engineer and the task is finding errors and holes in the data. That would be one task and we would produce one kind of explanation for that engineer, right? Um, so for instance, we might have a decision tree and we can look at the leaves of the tree and see how many data points uh, are in each of these leaves. And that might suggest areas where we need more data. We also might find a, a leaf where there's still, uh, uh, the, the algorithm wasn't able to really do very well in that leaf. There's a mix of, of data from multiple classes. 
And that's an error, that's a, that maybe those are labeling errors um, or maybe we need a new feature. So that's very useful for the machine learning engineer. Now let's consider another case where we're building a recommendation system and, and the user is the end user. Now they're, they're not trying to debug the recommendation system. They just want to know whether they should trust the recommendation. Uh, and so they might want to know, well, why are you recommending that I buy this Porsche or something? And uh, you know the system says, well, we think you're very rich and you would like this car. Um, so, uh, uh, and then uh, the third thing might be, again, for the ML engineer, and maybe we're building a predictive model or a reinforcement learning model. And, but the task now is maybe there, there are two, maybe there's a supplier company and then a customer company. And this machine learning engineer works in the customer's company and wants to know, uh, should, is this model good enough for us to use? So it's an acceptance testing question to decide whether the delivered system is sufficiently accurate for a particular purpose. So of course, uh, from the very beginning, Big ML has worked very hard on visualization tools to provide interpretability. That's, I guess, one of our, our brands. Um, and, uh, and at Oregon State University, in, in our research group, we're developing explanation tools for reinforcement learning. That's one of our, our big emphases these days. Okay, well, challenge number four is uncertainty quantification. Uh, so in 1980, this issue was totally ignored, but today we would really like to be able to give calibrated uncertainty estimates. And what do I mean by that? Well, when a classifier says that this data point X belongs to class C, and it says with probability 0.94, it should be correct 94% of the time. Uh, this is a notion that came out of weather forecasting, actually. Um, and so, uh, you know, when the weather, weatherman says 80% uh, chance of rain, they should be right 80% of the time. So we can measure calibration using a separate labeled calibration data set, or there are some uh, so-called out-of-bag tricks that can be used in random forests. So um, some classifiers are always well calibrated. It turns out decision trees and random forests uh, do not require any special calibration tools. But some of our most powerful uh, methods uh, generally are not well calibrated. So if we use boosted decision trees or support vector machines or deep neural networks, typically we, ha we have poorly calibrated models. And we can measure calibration using something called a reliability diagram. And the idea here is uh, uh, this was for a naive Bayes classifier, uh, just to show a really poorly uh, calibrated uh, classifier. Um, and what we do is we, we sort the predicted probabilities that come out of the model into bins, say 10 bins from 0 to 0 0.1, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, and so on. And I'm assuming we just have two classes here. So we're just predicting the probability of class 1, or we're looking at that for class 1. So when we have these very low probabilities, that means the classifier would be predicting class 0, uh, not class 1. So this would be actually very accurate uh, down here. So then what we do is on our calibration data, we, uh, we see, well, when the classifier outputs a probability, uh, say, between 0.7 and 0.8 over here, um, how often is it actually right? And whoa, it's only right about 48% of the time. So it's saying 0.75, but it really should be saying 0.48. So that's a good example of, of a case where the classifier is very optimistic. You can see all of these points on this diagram low, lie below the diagonal line which means that the predicted probabilities are much larger than the measured accuracies. So we're basically measuring accuracy within each bin and comparing it to the probabilities. So um, if we could fit a, an invertible curve to this line, like a monotonically increasing curve, then uh, if we provide a uh, naive Bayes score and uh, we could map that to the true score, and that's what, uh, um, these uh, calibration or recalibration functions do. We can fit a function to the reliability diagram. Often a sigmoid function tends to work well, um, which tells us something, I guess, about the nature of the, the kinds of failures. And uh, um, uh, we then can use this to convert predicted values into calibrated values. And you can see in this case, this is for a support vector machine which does not even output uh, probabilities, it just outputs something called the margin score. And so you can see we can use this to convert SVM margin scores into probabilities. So uh, this is something that I think you'll see more and more uh, tools supporting in the near future.
Now there is a big question about local versus global calibration. Um, we uh, uh, the calibration algorithm I'm describing here uh, compares uh, predicted probability and expected accuracy globally across the entire data set. But this can be misleading. So calibration can hide heterogeneity. And you've probably already uh, come across this. Um, if suppose you have a a, a data set where 80% um, of the data belongs to class one and only 20% of the data belongs to class two. Uh, a stupid classifier will just guess class one all the time and it will be 80% correct. Um, and so it, if it output 0.8 as its probability, it would be perfectly calibrated and still perfectly useless. So, uh, and we can have the same thing happen uh, in, in within these buckets. So we could have, a, or bins, a classifier could be achieving 95% accuracy in some region and so it can out, and if it outputs 0.95, then it's perfectly calibrated. But if you dug into that remaining 5%, that could be some specific customer segment. And within this segment, the classifier is, is terrible. It's outputting the wrong answer all the time. And so the real lesson is, um, if you have some insight into how your data uh, breaks out into sub segments, subgroups, um, really you should be calibrating each of those groups separately. Um, and so one thing, of course, that's good about decision trees is that they segment the data into different groups and each leaf of the tree is uh, calibrated separately. And that's why they don't have calibration problems. So, but it's always important to look at model accuracy in, in terms of individual customer segments and other customer features like gender and race, region, age, and so on. Um, you know, and a, a sort of notorious example is that a lot of face recognition systems and uh, more recently, speech recognition systems have been shown to be less accurate for certain subpopulations, like people with dark skin for face recognition. So uh, it's uh, there's a tendency, and maybe this is worse in the in the machine learning research community than in the real practitioner community. But there's a tendency to to look at the uh, headline accuracy number and say, "Hey, we're 95% accurate. It's great." Okay, well, the fifth challenge is runtime monitoring. Um, so uh, as, I, as I pointed out at the beginning, predictive models are only guaranteed to be accurate if the runtime queries are drawn from the same distribution as the training data. So the, the world is not changing, then, then, we, then we can be confident that we'll be doing well. Um, but, uh, but there are many uh, problems uh, where the data may be shifting uh, as, as I mentioned, at, at uh, test time. So for instance, um, one problem we've looked at is the open category problem. So it could be that at runtime, there may be data that belong to new classes that were not available at training time. These could be new types of objects in computer vision. These could be new classes of items in a recommender system. They could be new diseases in a medical system. Uh, they could be new types of fraud in a fraud detection system. And so uh, we need to be monitoring runtime to see if, uh, if strange things are happening that might signal that, that we have these uh, new, new objects coming along. Well, how can we monitor? Um, there are basically two strategies. Uh, the first is outlier detection. So, uh, and it works for each individual query one at a time. So given a new query, which I'll denote by XQ, we try to measure whether it's an outlier compared to the training data. And I'll be talking about this tomorrow in the same time slot uh, about algorithms for doing that. Um, and if, if it is an outlier, then maybe we should raise a little alarm or flag that um, and, and so that uh, we can be monitoring how many of those outliers we're seeing to, to uh, and, 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 and that would be a sign that we maybe need to retrain the classifier or, or collect new data and so on. The other thing doesn't work on individual data points, but if you can collect up some set of data points, say the L most recent data points uh, and the L points, some prior set of L points. You can you collect two data, data, two data sets, one that's very recent and one that's older. And then you ask, uh, label the recent ones, the new data set and label the old ones, the old data set, and then fit what I would call the old versus new classifier. If that classifier can tell the difference, can tell that which data set data points came from, then that's a that's a huge red flag that the distribution is changing on you. And in particular, you can look at the data points that the classifier is correctly predicting belong to our new data. Those are somehow um, 
where, where, the, where the distribution is moving toward. And you need to drill down and, and see whether those data points are being handled correctly. Okay, well, we did a big benchmarking study of, uh, of eight different published algorithms. And, uh, uh, and this back in 2013, and then we have an updated version from 2016. This was worked by my student, Andrew Emmett. Um, uh, because a, a lot of anomaly detection papers in the research literature only evaluate on very few data sets. And typically those are proprietary ones because people working in companies obviously can't share their uh, internal data. Or they, there were just a few public uh, uh, data sets, but they were very easy, like the KDD conference uh, challenge from 1999. So um, we uh, examined these uh, eight different kinds of algorithms. And uh, I say uh, tomorrow I'll go into this in more detail, but they fall into four general classes of techniques. Ones that try to estimate the probability density of the data and then score points that show up in empty space in low density regions as being outliers. Ones that are based on uh, distance to your neighbors, um, the neighbor-based methods. Ones that are quantile-based, which are uh, similar to the density-based ones, but they uh, tackle the easier problem of just uh, finding a, a surface that surrounds the data and uh, with the exception of, say, 5% of the data outside the boundary. And uh, then you can look at those. And then projection-based met methods. Um, and I want to talk about, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about those tomorrow. But, uh, but here are the results from our study. What we found was that an algorithm called the isolation forest was the best. Uh, so what this is, is, um, is, uh, is a change in one of these metrics. We looked at area under the ROC curve, which is, uh, in this case, is uh, a measure of how well the uh, outlier detector algorithm can rank outliers higher than non-outliers. And we also looked at lift. Um, which is related to you know how much better can it do that than we would expect just from random guessing, um, and uh, and we found that really this isolation forest algorithm, which which we didn't uh, uh, invent, is uh, invented by groups at Monash University and at Nanjing University, um, uh, was the best performer. Uh, There's sort of a five-way tie for second place, and then these quantile methods uh, did not work very well at all. Um, and so uh, based on the results of this. Uh, we uh, uh, big ML implemented the isolation forest, and so we offer that as our uh, sort of standard um, uh, anomaly detection method. So, how can we use this for open category detection, or in general for rejection? The idea is, uh, given a bunch of training data, we can train an anomaly detector and a classifier from that data, and then we can put them in series. So, given a query point x q. We first run it through the anomaly detector, and if the anomaly score, A of XQ, if that exceeds some threshold, tau, then, then we could reject or at least flag this data point um, and say, this looks strange to us. And if it says no, then, um, then, the, uh, then, then, then we can go ahead and apply the classifier. And the idea here is to try to guarantee that, that we are finding all of the, um, uh, the outliers and that uh, that we are uh, uh, so that we're so that when we make a prediction, it's accurate. That's of course always the motivation for having a rejection uh, thing in there. Um, uh, I I want to wait, say one other thing about this slide, which is that you might not necessarily want to reject. One of the weaknesses of outlier detection algorithms is they typically have, create a lot of false alarms. The trouble is that often there are uh, uh, heavy tails in the distribution of, of our data, um, and uh, and and so even even uh, data that belongs to the known categories, and we might even be correctly classifying it, could could be an outlier along some perhaps irrelevant dimension. So I think um, you know we were interested in trying to get a guarantee, and we have a theoretical paper here from uh, our, my student Celio, um, but. Uh, 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 but but the but but I think in practice what you would want to do is is log the, the any of these data points where you're getting uh, high anomaly scores, and then be monitoring how many of those alarms you're getting each day or each week, and and if because there will be some background level of alarms and it should just be some small fraction of the data points. If that starts to climb with time, then you know you're in trouble. Something's changing, and you need to pay attention. 
the other thing we can do is this change detection, as I mentioned. Um, uh, so for here, we, for, for example, could collect the 200 most recent points uh, and the, I mean, 100 most recent points and the 100 points prior to them, um, and then do what's known as a two sample test in statistics. Um, we have this sample of 100 points drawn from, uh, we'll call it probability distribution PA, and these 100 points drawn from probability distribution PB, and the hypothesis we want to test is, is PA equal to BB or are they different? Has the distribution shifted? And there are, there's a, a very nice um, uh, a line in statistics uh, called kernel two sample tests that's been developed particularly by Arthur Gretton and his colleagues. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, something that, that may be more useful and performs very well is just to train an old versus new classifier. So you can just set this up and uh, we'll actually work an example like this tomorrow, I believe, um, and try to train a classifier to tell the difference between SA and SB and ask, well, can it do better than random guessing? Um, and then as new data come in, of course, you can, uh, as data point X201 comes in, you can push 101 into this data set and drop X1 off at the end, slide the data forward, the, these two sets forward, and train a classifier again, if you, if you want to do it data point by data point. But you might do it day by day or week by week, uh, something like this. So this is a very active area of research. The advantage of the old versus new classifier, as I said, is that it, the data points that it's predicting with high confidence belong to set B uh, will be ones for you to focus your attention on. So it also gives you uh, kind of an anomaly score for each data point. OK, well, the final challenge is, that I want to talk about is evaluation. So the standard metrics that have been developed for evaluating classifiers, such as area under the ROC curve or the F1 score, were developed really for machine learning research. And in, in my experience, most real applications require their own metrics. So for instance, if I'm looking at financial fraud, then uh, suppose that in my company, I have five fraud analysts uh, on my team, and that each analyst can examine 10 possible cases per day. So I can really only look at 50 cases a day. So then the metric I would want to have in fraud detection would be the expected financial value of the top 50 alarms. So if each potential fraud, we can also estimate how expensive it would be to the company if it was a fraud. Like, so let's say it's a, it's a, a loan that's not gonna pay off. Maybe that's not a fraud. Or, or, but it could be a transaction that looks suspicious. You can look at the dollar value of that transaction and, uh, and, and then um, take that into account in the order. So this, is, this incorporates that value into the candidate fraud alarm rate and not just uh, area under the ROC curve or something like that. And if we were doing open category detection because we wanted to uh, detect 90, 99% of all of these queries that belong to a new category, then maybe we'd want to have what's called precision at 99% recall, right? So the recall in this case is uh, how, how, uh, what fraction of the of these open category queries um, can we, uh, are we seeing, are we detecting? And then subject to that, we would like to maximize our precision so that we don't have too many false alarms. But if we're doing obstacle detection for self-driving cars, 99% isn't nearly good enough. I don't know how many nines you would need, but let's say 99.999% of all of the dangerous obstacles we need to detect. On the other hand, if we're in a medical case where we're interested in cancer screening, then we need to trade off the false alarms versus the missed alarms. And the metric probably is something like the cost to the patient, which may vary from one patient to another. And it's maybe not surprising that area under the ROC curve is a fairly good metric in this case. Uh, in fact, the medical community was one of the first to adopt that as a metric. Okay, well, let me summarize then. Uh, I've talked about uh, six or five frontiers uh, for uh, machine learning applications. I talked about the need for generalization and how can we go beyond uh, just uh, IID data? How can we generalize to new data that, that has a different distribution than the distribution we trained on? And I talked about causal transportability and domain adaptation. And both of these are uh, still pretty much in the research community. Um, I don't know of any tool that supports them. Um, so uh, we're still getting experience with them. The second is feature engineering. Uh, of course, it's very important. 
Uh, deep learning doesn't solve the problem completely, but it can discover use for inter useful intermediate features in some cases. Uh, uncertainty quantification, I talked about the problem of calibration of probabilities. And then runtime monitoring, I talked about uh, anomaly detection or outlier detection and change point or uh, uh, distribution shift detection. And finally, I uh, talked about application specific metrics and the need to go beyond just uh, taking the uh, accuracy or the area under the ROC curve as our, as our metrics. 